it's the middle of the night, and residents in and around Endelin, North Dakota are fast asleep, completely unaware that one of the strongest tornadoes in the last decade is heading straight towards them. But to understand how this all unfolded, we have to go one day back. It's June 19th and meteorologists at the Storm Prediction Center are keeping a close eye on the weather, as all the ingredients for a widespread tornado outbreak are coming together. Temperatures and dew points are in the mid-60s and 70s. A strong mid-level trough was also forecast to eject over the northern plains, which featured a moderate upper-level divergence to promote lift and shear. The convective available potential energy, or CAPE, was at 3,000 to over 4,000 joules per kilogram, four times what is needed for tornadoes to form. A strong low-level jet was also forecast to emerge past dusk. In the plains, the low-level jet plays a massive role in tornado formation. The low-level jet is a fast-moving stream of air about a kilometer above the surface, which causes a huge increase in low-level shear and storm-relative flow. The low-level jet is well known to dramatically strengthen after dark. Due to a pressure change, cooling faster than lower elevations. This is most notable and common in the Great Plains. With these combined factors, the Storm Prediction Center issued a significant tornado threat, with a 10% chance of an EF2 to EF5 tornado happening in that area. The setup is primed. All that is needed is a trigger. The residents of Endelin, North Dakota wake up to bright sunny skies. Although the weather was nice, that would soon change. Just after midday, cumulus clusters start to organize, and only one hour later, two discrete supercells would quickly develop. A powerful deratio is also present 190 miles west of the supercells, and would eventually catch up and merge with the two discrete storms. Keep this in mind for later. Soon, tornado warnings were issued for areas around Jamestown and Spiritwood, and at exactly 1.51pm, the first tornado would touch down. The tornado would manifest as a large photogenic cone, and at one point would go stationary before becoming completely rain wrapped. It would end up tracking for 8 miles, mostly over open farmland, although it would impact a few structures, and was rated EF3. Just before dark, the supercell would cycle and would produce another large rain wrapped wedge near Valley City. It would once again remain over open farmland and was rated EF2. After this, something interesting happens. The two supercells have been drawing closer and closer together for the past few hours now. The northern storm has been the most dominant, producing all of the strong tornadoes so far. But as the storms are so close together now, the southern supercell's forward flank downdraft is pushing stable air into the northern storm's inflow, essentially cutting off its air source and choking it to death. Now, with no competition over the atmosphere, this storm immediately intensifies and would produce a strong EF2 tornado to the north of the Fort Ransom area. After this tornado dissipates, the supercell continues to intensify. The nocturnal low-level jet is now rapidly intensifying, causing a large increase in low-level shear, helping the storm to intensify even more. At this point, videos are coming in of the incredible lightning intensity present in the storm. The storm is beginning to develop a much more powerful mesocyclone, and appears to be getting ready to drop a monster. A storm chaser was in the perfect position to watch this, two miles east of Lisbon looking towards Endelon. He watches as flashes of lightning reveal an increasingly low base. He's about to witness the birth of a monster. It's got a nice bowl shape there. Oh, wait, here we go. Yep, I think there's a tornado there. Yep, that's a tornado. Definitely on the ground. It's getting bigger. It's turning into a wedge. It's huge. Almost immediately after touching down, the tornado forms into a giant's wedge. For the first few miles of its life, it stayed over open fields, causing no substantial damage, but it's now closing in on a railroad with a stalled freight train on it. The entire train was violently derailed. The train had over 35 carts, 19 of them were fully loaded with grain hopper cars, weighing up to 286,000 pounds. 
The other 14 were empty, but still weighed up to £75,000. Four of the cars were thrown into a field, including one that was tossed over 300 metres. Multiple wheels were also ripped off the train carts. The damage that occurred in this area was truly incredible. At this point, residents in the town of Endelin record the massive mesocyclone, with the apparent monster tornado under it. The tornado then turned north-northeastward, growing to its peak width of over a mile. Unfortunately, the tornado would impact its first home, violently destroying it. Thankfully, no one was at home at the time. Moving along the Maple River and approaching North Dakota 46 at EF4 intensity, an entire forest of trees along the river was levelled, with only stubs of the trees left behind. Severe debarking of trees was also present, with some of them being sandpapered, and others lofted with the root ball still attached. The violence tornado is now crossing Nebraska 46 into Class County, and is closing in on two homes. In one of the homes are 73-year-old Michael and his wife Catherine. They are both fast asleep, completely unaware of the monster heading their way. All of the homes in this area are completely obliterated. Tragically, both Michael and Catherine die in the tornado. The debris surrounding the homes are shredded, a sign of an extremely violent tornado. More severe tree uprooting, debarking and sandpapering would occur in this area. The tornado is now manifesting as a huge dusty wedge. Unfortunately, it's now closing in on a farmstead. In it is 89 year old Macario, who's also fast asleep, unaware of the monster tornado heading her way. The extreme winds would level the house, tragically killing her. Trees in this area would once again be uprooted or leveled. At this point, the tornado is beginning to shrink and weaken, but not before causing more EF3 damage to a line of telephone towers, ripping them down, twisting and crushing them. After striking the telephone towers, the tornado is beginning to fully dissipate and starts to rope out. And after being on the ground for 12 miles and 19 minutes, tragically killing three people, the Endelin EF5 includes in the field at 11.34pm north of town. But immediately afterwards, the supercell cycles and produces another powerful tornado. Aaron Rigsby, positioned on Nebraska 46, was in the perfect spot to film the wedge tornado. Although little does he know, due to the derecho from earlier slamming into the supercell, the tornado is now heading due south, straight toward him. He'd watch and hear as the roar slowly got louder and louder. Aaron realises the extreme danger he's in, and turns around and heads west, narrowly missing the tornado. After the powerful tornado dissipates, the derecho would fully merge with the supercells, ending any further tornado potential. The next day, the National Weather Service would survey the damage. The main area of interest was the train, where multiple carriages had been thrown over 100 metres. The National Weather Service would give the tornado a rating of EF3, although after analysing the damage, they worked out that the winds needed to throw the train cars over 300 metres would have to be in excess of 260 miles per hour. So on October 7th, 2025, the first EF5 in 12 years was announced. But this begs the question, out of all the tornadoes that deserve the EF5 rating, why this one? Nuran, Chickasha, Goldsby, El Reno, Valonia, Rachel, Soso, Mayfield, Rolling Fork, and Greenfield, Iowa. All of these tornadoes were well capable of getting the EF5 rating, yet they all fell short of it. There are quite a few tornadoes that likely should have been rated EF5, but I'm only going to cover the most outrageous ones. Both the El Reno and Greenfield tornadoes had winds over 300 miles per hour, some of the highest ever recorded on Earth. In my opinion, this should easily justify an EF5 rating, yet they both weren't rated EF5, completely misrepresenting their true strength. 
The Goldsby and Chickasha tornadoes had multiple damage indicators with the max assigned wind speed being 200 miles per hour, one mile per hour below the EF5 rating. The Mayfield and Uran tornadoes both swept away Wellbill's homes, with the debris around them being wind road, something that only occurs in the strongest tornadoes. The Mayflower Valonia tornado also swept away multiple Wellbill's homes, including an entire block of houses. The same thing as the Goldsby and Chickasha tornadoes happened with the Faradale Ranch L EF4, which, in 20 different places, had a max assigned wind speed of 200 miles per hour. I think it's very unlikely that the wind speed was not over 200 miles per hour at one of those locations. In a 2021 paper released by well-respected scientists, stated, supercell tornadoes are much stronger and wider than damage-based ratings indicate. They observed that 20% of all tornadoes have extreme winds which are more than capable of causing EF4 or even EF5 damage. A stark contrast to the less than half a percent by the National Weather Service. The paper also states that the National Weather Service underestimates tornadoes by an average of 1.5 ratings. Now, I'm not trying to hate on the NWS for this, but more to bring to light how often tornado ratings are misrepresented, and how if the Endelin EF5 hadn't hit the train, the EF5 drought would likely still be going. But what doesn't change any of this is that all of these tornadoes deeply affected people's lives.